I've been looking forward to coming to here for a long time. We graduated from school in June of 2020, and we've been trying to work things out since then. And yes, of course, COVID, and that really was a setback. It was a really, really tough time in India. You know, imagine we still had the freedoms here to go to the grocery store if we needed to, to go to Home Depot, Lowe's. I, I, I could go anywhere I wanted, pretty much. We wore a mask, but in India, things shut down, and it was very severe. And for a time, people were very hungry. And if I could paint the picture for you of what India looks like, there are so many people, so many people. In just a few years, India will, overcome, will pass China as the largest country in the world, at about 2 billion people. And if you take this area, if you, you count Maryville and Knoxville together, I'm not sure what the population is, but I know it's not a million. This size of place in India, there will probably be 30 million people. And you imagine going down the street and there's just people everywhere. There's people everywhere. And there's people just sitting around all day long and you wonder, what are they doing? Well, there's just so many people, someone's got to sit around. <laughs> but there are people everywhere. And when the government says, you can't come out of your home or we will arrest you, then those people who depended on waking up in the morning and going into the fields to work could not go to work, then they could not eat. And so we provided funds for them so that food could be purchased. And with that, we helped Christians and non-Christians alike, as Galatians 6.10 gives us the authority to help all men, especially those of the household of faith. India is a country, as I said, of nearly 2 billion people. There are the high caste and the low caste. There are two main languages. There are a lot of different languages, but the two main languages, Hindi is spoken by the high, by the high caste. If you go to uh, grocery stores here or gas stations where we live in the northern part of Tennessee in Macon County, in Lafayette, all the gas stations are ran by Indians. They are high caste Indians. They would speak Hindi. And so language is a barrier in India plus the caste system. So caste system, if you're a low caste, doesn't mean you're poverty stricken and it's terrible and you'll never be able to make it out. But there's that barrier that's existed for a long time. And the beautiful thing about the gospel, as Galatians 3, 26 and following tells us, there's no caste system in India. And we preach that because we're all one in Christ. India is a beautiful place, despite the fact that there's trash piled up everywhere. If you've ever gone to a third world country, it pretty much is that, but it's multiplied because there's nearly 2 billion people. When you go down the road and there's a pig eating in the trash right outside the school building, or there's cattle crossing the road as the farmer's taking them right down the village street to go out into the country somewhere. And there's trash piled up. And there's people using the restroom on the side of the road. And then you're riding along and all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, there's a church building. And it says Church of Christ. And that's where the Lord's people meet. And it's a beacon. And you realize how strong an influence the church has in India. And tonight I want to share with you some things about India. Of course, we made a trip in April. That was my first opportunity to be able to go. I was a school teacher for nearly 15 years. When my dad first went in 2002. He came back, and I was in college at the time. He says, one day I want you to go with me. 2002. Well, I taught school. You can't go to the principal and say, hey, I need two weeks off of school or three weeks off of school. You don't go to India in the summertime. It will be as hot as 130 degrees. In April, it was over 100 degrees every day when we were there. So in the summertime, you don't go. So a teacher can't go in the summertime to India because it's too hot. And the people just wouldn't come out. It's too dangerous. There's not air conditionings in every building. And what vehicles they have don't all have air conditioning. So the best place for an Indian in the summertime is inside in the shade. And they would not get out and travel and come to meetings. When we were there, of course, it was over 100 degrees. And what, we had what were called um, preacher meetings. And, and in our terms, we would say, well, that's where a lot of preachers come together. And they meet and have lunch and talk about the Bible. No, preacher meetings means the preacher is going to come from his village. And he's going to bring people with him that he's been studying the Bible with. There was a man who brought several men with him, and he said, we traveled six hours to come to this meeting, and we don't have money to go back home. And he was asking for money. They came to hear the gospel. That preacher brought those people he had been studying with to hear the gospel. And in most places we went to, that was the case. Preacher meetings. In one location, they had been waiting since 10 a.m. in the morning, and we didn't arrive until about 6.30 at night. And it wasn't our fault we were that late. 
It's nobody's fault in India that you're late. There's no such thing as late in India. It's just Indian time. So they had been waiting all day, and various men had been preaching. And we arrive, and there's probably 800 people there. And those people traveled, and they haven't eaten. And they're sitting there, and they're patiently sitting there. And you don't see people fidgeting with their cell phones. You don't see them nodding off. They're waiting to hear the word of the Lord spoken. Every village we went to, every preacher's meeting we went to, souls responded to the gospel. Not because of what we did as Americans. Not because here's some bald white guy that's really tall and he shows up and he starts pe- preaching from the Bible and all of a sudden everybody's, whoa, it's amazing. No, it's because of the work that's done by the preachers that are there. And because they put diligent effort into study and they study with people and hearts are receptive. It's amazing the people you can study with in India. It's amazing the denominational preachers that will show up to a school of preaching that the Church of Christ has because they hear there's a Bible study. I guarantee you Wayne's tried to contact people in town, denominational preachers, and ask for studies. There's been debates set up. Don Blackwell was supposed to have a debate, and the guy backed out. You just can't do that in states, but in India they come out from all over when you say there's a Bible study. And so opportunity exists. And when those preachers come to those meetings and bring those individuals with them, the gospel's taught, and souls respond. In one location, there were 143 people. You'll see that picture in a moment. India is a beautiful place because the people there are beautiful people, and they need the gospel. And we're so very thankful that you support the work as a congregation. And I'm going to encourage you and invite you, as we look at some things later, as individual families, please consider supporting the work. It's a very large work, the largest mission work that I know of. For the sheer size of land mass we're trying to cover, the number of people that are involved in it, and the number of souls that are being saved. 85% of converts remain faithful. 85%. And if you understood what it means to convert to Christianity out of Hinduism, it's, it's somewhat a challenge here for people. Because a family member might say, oh, you're going over there, Church of Christ. They think they're the only ones going to heaven. And, and someone's studying the Bible and they know what the Bible says. And their family might ridicule them a little bit. Might get teased at work because you won't go drink with everybody else at a happy hour. But in India, when you choose to become a Christian, many people, that means they're cut off from their family. They have no resources. Wives are kicked out of their homes. Sons are disowned from the family and will not receive an inheritance. The land that they own, the house that they lived in, is no longer theirs when they choose to become Christians. But yet, mass amounts of people are turning to Christ. And 85%, based on a 20-year study, 85% are remaining faithful to the Lord. Because they're not inundated with media, with social media, with television, with movies, with music. All they know is to wake up and go to work and survive and to provide for their family. And when you tell them there's one God... And that God loves you, and He gave His Son to die for you. And you not have to worry about millions of gods, and which one am I going to please, and which one am I going to upset. And you're not worried about some man telling you you're not good enough. When you show them the truth of the gospel, the simplicity of the message of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and they have to hear, they have to believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully, it's a buy-in. Because they know that's the only choice. And I think too many times we see so many things around us that it's actually better to live in India than it is in the United States. Let's go very quickly because I told Wayne we'd be done before 8 o'clock, so I promise I'll be done before 8 o'clock. We went to 38 villages. This is April 18th through April the 29th. Actually, the 29th, we're on our way back home. It was really weird. We left India on a Thursday night at 11.45 p.m. We arrived in Nashville at noon the next day. Talk about messing with your mind. When we left there on the 18th on a Monday, we flew up to New York, and it was 9.30 at night when we left. And I fell asleep, and it was about 1.30 in the morning central time. And I looked outside, and I could see the sun coming up. That was not fun. It was a miserable flight over there because everything's thrown off. When we arrived, it took us a short time to adjust. We went to 38 villages. Based on my phone tracking things, it told me 3,219 miles of flying. That's not just flying over there, but that's when you get over there, you have to fly to another city, fly back, and so forth. 100, over 1,000 miles of driving. 
My data said I went 731 miles driving. And that's from village to village to back to the hotel and village and so forth. With the whole team, it's fair to say that it was well over 1,000 miles of driving. But those numbers don't mean anything compared to the 394 conversions. 394 souls. And people in the past have asked, so, so really that many? They've gone before where there'd be seven or 800 in a three-week campaign. That many? So are they just getting them wet? Are they promising them something they'll come? No, these are people that they've been studying with for a long time. And they're convinced by the truth of the gospel. And like I said, 85%, I'm not good with math, but 85% 85 of 394, far better number than we see here in the States. Here's our team. My father is standing down on the bottom in the pink shirt, and he sweat the whole time we were there. It was over 100 degrees every day. So that's my father, Glenn Holmes. He's gone to India, I think, nine or ten times over the years. I'm standing right behind him. The other pink shirt and the bald man there, that's Jack Cunnicutt. He was the coordinator of the work for over 20 years. And he wanted to retire, and so it was a great transition period. I got to spend time with him. We traveled places and, of course, got to go to India. The man standing in the middle of the bottom is Brother John Ratnam. He is our main contact, and when you receive the newsletter, it's sent by Brother John Ratnam. He writes it. If you read it, you can tell the English is very good, but you can tell it's not American English. It's the British theme uh, English, so it sounds a little bit different. But he is our contact. We're staying at his home to his uh, left, our right, is his wife Indira, a very godly woman, and what a great servant of the Lord. There in their house, what they, we would call a compound, they have over 60 orphans living there and probably 25 to 30 widows. She's a mother to all the orphans, and she's a sister and helper of all the widows that live there. I wish you could meet her in this life, but you'll meet her in heaven. Because of the work she's done for the Lord, God will not forget all of her sacrifices. To the right of her is one of their nieces. The man behind up there, does that have a laser pointer on this? I might turn it off. The man standing up in the top right is Brother Bishop. He's a young man, translates, a very good individual, loves the Lord, and I got to spend some time with him. He translated for me. Their two daughters are there, Rebecca and Lenora. Um, Rebecca is going to come to the States and study for a little while. They're both in the university. One is going to medical school to be a doctor, and the other is in some type of finance. And then at the very top, the left, is Brother John Anand. He is the instructor of the Tooney School of Preaching, a very educated man. They have degrees in English. They went to school to study English so that they could be better preachers and better translators, not to advance their career and make more money, but so that they could be better Christians. And so Brother John and Brother John have both gone to school to be educated in English so that they may better help the work of the Lord. Thank you for your support. As I mentioned earlier, we set goals each year through discussions with our Indian brethren, what their needs are. Sometimes those things shift from year to year. If I, I wish I could just, you could see it and you could be there. And I wish I could clearly just describe it to you, the poverty. If it were not for our help, I don't know what would happen. I'm not doubting the Lord. And maybe, maybe this is the Lord's way. This is, this is how it works because God's given us blessings so that we're able to give to them. If it were not for our help, the church would not be where it is now. And the souls that have been reached would not have been reached. Even by what we might say are the little things. And I thank you so much. All of our goals were met for last year. We set goals and they're lofty goals. But imagine, though, a country in a place where if it wasn't for our help, they wouldn't be able to do it. Or it would be very, very difficult for them to do it. Just because of the way the caste system works. And just the severe poverty in the country and the way their government works. Here are our goals for this year. Bibles are a very, very important part. We can buy Bibles in India. It's quite surprising in a Hindu country, but we can buy Bibles in India cheaper. So we buy Bibles there, a dollar for a New Testament, three fifty for a full Bible, Old and New Testament. So we buy Bibles and we pass them out everywhere we go. Most of the people we give them to cannot read, but it is a prized possession because they'll carry it home and it just doesn't just go on the shelf. They'll find someone that can read to them. Their grandchildren, some family member, someone in the village will read to them. 
There was a story of a widow who could not read, but she had a Bible and had her grandchildren read the scriptures to her. She became a Christian, and she converted individuals by simply turning to the page. She knew where the scripture was on the page, and she pointed it to people, but she couldn't read it herself. She knew what it meant to be saved according to the scriptures, and she would point it out to people. She couldn't read it, but she could show them where to read themselves. And that's what they do. They make do. Bicycles for preachers. A bicycle is $100. We're very near our goal of buying bicycles, and we'll probably double that by the end of the year. A preacher will take a bicycle, and he'll use it to travel from village to village on the Lord's Day to preach. He'll use it during the week with a portable PA system to preach in villages. It's a key component of their work, bicycles. PA systems, we have portable ones that are $150. They're pretty nice size, battery powered. You can take them home and plug them in and charge them, and they're very loud and they use them to broadcast in the whole village. The other PA system for $250 is a big one that goes on the outside of a church building. They don't have a PA system inside the building. Because they don't need one inside the building. They put it on the outside. And the buildings are situated in locations where people can't help but pass by. Or people living in the village can't help but hear the gospel. And there are countless stories of souls who lived in the village, heard the gospel preached Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and because someone went and knocked on their door and asked, hey, would you like to have a Bible study? And they say, yes, I've been listening. I'm interested to know more about Jesus. And they've been converted because the PA system's on the outside of the building. Wells and baptistries, there are remote locations that do not have adequate drinking water. So they're traveling a long distance to bucket water back to where they live, especially in those hot summer months. They might have water in other months, but not all the time. And so a well is provided with the baptistry so that they can immerse individuals. They don't say, well, let's wait till next Tuesday. We'll travel on down that way. No, it's immediate. They won't eat until they're immersed. And we came across that in some of the villages. They would not eat lunch until they were immersed, because it was that important to them. And it should be that important to us also. Buildings, church buildings, we build buildings. Those are important, important tools. They're not super fancy. You'll see some pictures of them. They're not nice like our buildings. We can build a building for $10,000. That's a two-level building. The preacher will likely live in the bottom, or it will be a meeting place for preachers when they travel from locations to meet and to study God's Word. And then the, the Lord's people will meet upstairs. It's a very simple concrete building. They have electricity, but they don't have air conditioning. They don't have toilets. Very, very simple. Could be built for $10,000. Printing. We'll talk more about that later. We have a goal of $100,000 in printing. We don't print Bibles, but everything else you can think of, it's printed there. The church has their own printing press. We don't go to Hindu printers and say, print this Christian material, because they probably wouldn't do it. And so that was a very interesting part, seeing the printing press. We have a need for monthly commitments. Those are our yearly goals, but each month we're trying to support 294 widows, over 400 orphans. A widow supported by $10 a month. $10 a month. That's food so that they can eat for that month. That doesn't account any kind of personal things they want when they go to the market. That's just to provide food for them. There, you can do the math. For $10 a month of 294 widows, that's what we're trying to send each month to make sure there's enough food provided for them. Orphans, it's $25 because they have school clothes. They have uniforms. They have books. And then they're being taken care of. They live there. They're taught the gospel. When they're old enough, they graduate high school. See, high school for them ends in 10th grade, and then they go to what they call junior college, 11th and 12th grade year. And then they're going out into the workforce. They're arranged marriages. And so you have young people growing up in these orphans' homes. They're taught the gospel. They become Christians, and then they're married to a Christian. And it's a great system. There's 417 of those. We're supporting 400 preachers. There are 1,200 preachers involved in this work in the area that that we're working in. Some of them are living in areas where congregations can support them. But some of them go, and I've seen it, the most someone would be able to give is a few coins. And it would amount to less than 50 cents in our money. And in some places, you'll see someone bring a small bowl. And they'll walk up to the front, and there'll be a bowl there, and they'll bring what little rice they could as an offering to the Lord. And they'll dump that rice in that bowl, because that's all they have. And so the preacher's able to eat, 
and sometimes he has some money to be able to live. But we need to support preachers. They're supported by $50 a month, which in itself is not enough, but they make do. Printing, they're trying to print monthly, and they have to pay people to work. So it's $2,500 to pay the men to work at the printing press. If you don't have money to pay them, they don't work. And they want to print at least $1,500 of materials. I have some materials. If someone knows Telugu, you could read Tom Holland's book here, Sermon Delivery and Design. They're printing these books for preacher students. Becky Honeycutt's Sister, I Need You. For widows and other sisters and congregations, they're printing her book. They're printing Back to the Bible. And it's larger, and we like it. And we said, we need these big ones in the United States. We have the small ones. But they're printing these and using these in villages. And then tracts are being written and printed. And we saw all of that at the printing press. They need support each month. What happens is we'll send them money when we receive it, but they may be months behind on paying individuals or printing the materials that they need. And then there's a preaching school. Uh, it's called the Herald School of Biblical Studies. And it's a school designed to teach men who were former denominational preachers. And there are a lot of denominational preachers being converted in India. Because those men have only been taught one thing. They open up the Bible and they're just teaching what they've been taught. But when someone shows them the truth and they're able to make those connections, they realize there's but one church. And they're converted to Christ. And they want to preach, but it's not wise to send them out without training. So they go to the Herald School. It's a long rectangular room. It's probably all the way back to that corner and there'll be 50 men studying in there. And sometimes denominational preachers come to study. They hear a Bible study and they show up. So when they preach the truth, they preach things about proper use of the Lord's Supper, women's roles in the church, leadership in the church, so forth, so that those men are educated in what the Bible says, not what their traditions tell them. Jack Honeycutt was a coordinator of the work for over 20 years. And I don't know if you've ever met Jack before. He's been all around in gospel meetings and places, but what a character, and I really appreciate it. I just take the opportunity to be thankful for Jack and what he's done. It's been a great transition. You can see in that top left picture there the huge flower wreath. And this was to honor him and his retirement from the work when we were there in India. And they placed that huge flower wreath around his neck. They spent time and money that they could have used somewhere else. And they did that to honor Jack. And so we honor him and thank him for all that he's done for the work. In the bottom picture down there, we're at a widow's home and he's giving his own money, his own money, to the widows. And then when we got back from India, all the rupees that he had, the Indian money, he didn't go and exchange it. He gave it to me and said, you use it the next time you go. Between him and my father, it was over $1,000 in American money. That he says, you take it back and use it again in India. That's the kind of individual that I got to spend time with and learn from and work with. I just wanted to be thankful for him and to share a little bit about him. India is a very beautiful place. It teaches us many lessons there are so many things that I learned about myself when I was in India, about what it means to be a father and a husband and a Christian and a preacher. I gained a greater appreciation for the scriptures, scriptures that you and I looked at for years and years, and we know they're true, but until you go somewhere else and see how it applies in the lives of individuals that are different from us, and then do you understand what it means about godliness with contentment. Because you know those people over there have little to nothing and they're the happiest people that you ever meet. And we're worried about not having enough ketchup. Or we got cheese on our food instead of something else that we wanted. We hear our children say sometimes. India changes. This April trip was the latest in the spring anyone had ever been to India before. And so we saw something interesting that we'd never seen. Here in the States, we go to the store, we buy a can of cashews, and they're already prepackaged, ready for us to take home and eat immediately. But what we saw in India for the first time was the cashew fruit. The fruit grows in the nut on the bottom. And I don't know if you've ever knew that or seen it before, but the fruit is edible at a certain time. It's ripened there. If you eat it too early, it's very acidic. But there's a cashew. We know that it came from somewhere, but we don't always see it happening when it happens. 
And so that, that really put something in my mind, planted in my mind, what I thought I really wanted to share about India. And that is the fruits of India. In Luke chapter 6, um, my Bible says that it's connected with Matthew chapter 7. I don't know if that's exact the same context in Matthew chapter 7 and Jesus speaks about fruits and the trees. He's speaking about false teachers. In Luke 6, that's not recorded for us, but the principle is the same and could be applicable for false teachers or for a Christian. Are there fruits being produced? So in Luke 6 and verse 43, Jesus says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does bad fruit or a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. It's pretty clear to us. If you have an apple tree in your yard, you know if it's a good apple tree because apples will be produced. We had apple trees growing up, and we had a very large apple tree produced nothing at all, and it got cut down. The smallest apple tree we had produced the biggest apples. So sometimes we look at a tree and we think, I just don't think that tree will be very good, but yet it produces more than any other. The point Jesus is making here is, if it's good, you'll see the fruits of it. If it's bad, you'll see the fruits of it. You can't be bad, but yet be deceiving and produce good fruits. The truth cannot be hidden. Up in the top left is a coconut tree. We saw a lot of coconut trees and we saw a lot of coconuts on the tree. And then the holes, when you go into the village, they just throw them on the side of the road. So you saw large piles of holes everywhere. The top right is a guava tree. I don't know if you've ever had guava before, but it's pretty good fruit. We saw guava trees with the fruit growing on them. And then my favorite, the mango, in the bottom left. It looks like a bundle of socks tied on a rope to the tree. But that's the mango, and they were very, very good. The ones you buy in the store here in the States, they're not any good. The ones in India are really, really good. They squeeze them, they take the part of them, they squeeze them, suck the juice out, and then they eat it. And my wife says, you can't do that. And I said, yes, you can. <laughs> in the bottom right are banana trees. I saw a lot of banana trees, but everywhere I went, I did not see a single banana growing on a tree. It's not that it wasn't season, and it wasn't that every tree I saw without bananas were bad trees, because what we saw in the villages were the farmers coming in with the large bundles of bananas, or on the way into the village, we passed by people carrying a big bundle of bananas on their shoulder. So the point with this is really, yes, we see the fruit on the tree, we know it's a good tree, we know it's producing good fruit, but sometimes we see trees and they're not producing fruit. We don't see it happening at the time but we see the, fruit, the product of it in another way. Just because we don't see a church doing something, but we know they produce fruit, or a Christian, we can see them sometimes in the things they do. Did Jesus not say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven? We're supposed to produce, and we're supposed to produce in front of people and for people so that we can glorify God. But the point I make about the banana tree is, Sometimes we don't see the fruits. And so part of our trip to India is to go and look and see what's going on and to look for the fruits. And boy, there are a lot of fruits, literally and spiritually. Well, four areas we'll cover. The fruits of worship, the fruits of evangelism, the fruits of benevolence, and the fruits of edification. The evidence is four. Jesus says a good tree produces good fruit. And we saw a lot of good fruit. Fruits of worship. John 4, 24, you're familiar with that passage. Jesus and the Samaritan woman are at the well. And she's speaking about they as Samaritans had to worship in the mountain and the Jews would worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says there's a time coming where it won't be like that. And he speaks about worship and he says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. With the right frame of mind or attitude, with sincerity, and based upon truth. You and I don't get to decide what's truthful worship or not. We go by what the scriptures say. And so when we go somewhere, whether it's here in the States and we're traveling, or in a foreign country, we're looking for those things. If I was traveling and didn't know anyone here and I came in and I saw something that looked off, maybe you traveled somewhere and it said Church of Christ on the sign, but we went in, there's a band up on the stage. And you'd say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like what the scriptures describe as truthful worship. Colossians 
We know that whatever we do in word or deed, we do by the authority of Jesus Christ. If it's not found in Scripture, we're not authorized to do it. We can't add to or take away. So there are five acts of worship we're familiar with. No doubt this morning you participated in those five. I was at home with my daughter, so I watched the, the lesson and listened to it, but I couldn't participate in those five because I was at home. But we sing, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we give up our means, we pray, and the Word of God is preached and we study and we open up our Bibles. And so if it's a good tree, we should see the evidences of it. Pictured on the left is what it would look like in most villages when you would go into the church building. The church building's not a holy place. This building's not holy. It's just a building. We try to make that clear with our children. Gage is four and try to make that clear with him. We are going to go worship to God. We're not going to church. We are the church. And Christ is the head of the church. We go to worship in a building. And we just had that discussion. We're going to the church building to worship God. And so that's what it looks like. Those are tarps on the floor of bags that they've sewn together. And that's their floor. And you'll see there's a stand there and it's concrete. And you see people sitting on either side. And no, it doesn't look like what you and I would see. But they're doing what the scriptures say. Picture there on the bottom. It looks like a butterfly net. It looks different than what you and I are used to seeing. But those are their baskets to take up the collection. And so in an auditorium in a church building, there were about 800 that Lord's Day. There were about 200, or give or take, upstairs in, in the balcony, and most everyone down in the bottom. And they're sitting very close to one another. You'll see a picture in a second. And the men walked along through with this little basket on a handle, and every single person that I could see, every single person put something in that basket. We give collectively as a family. We write a check. And that checks for my wife and myself and what we've earned and been given by the Lord. And we give with a check. In India, they don't have checkbooks. They don't have debit cards. Most of the widows you saw put just a few coins in. And a few of the men or families put in cash. But every single person gave of their means. There's evidence, the fruit of it. This is what it would look like on the Lord's Day in a location where the gospel is being preached. There's an American man who speaks English. He's using an iPad. I remember the first time I saw someone with an electronic device and I said, that's sinful. Oh no, we can't do that. It has to be a Bible. We have to open it up. And I thought, what does it matter? It's the Bible. It's the Bible. And so he's using a Bible. He's preaching. And then there's a translator. I wish you could hear it. Because you preach in English, you pause for a second, and they're preaching. And if you point with your finger, they point with their finger. If you raise your voice up, they raise their voice up. If you get soft, they get soft. Everything that you say, they're trying to translate it in that language as best as possible. And sometimes we may do something. Wayne says, oh, in Mark 16, 16, you know, we're supposed to go out all the world. Well, the translator wouldn't do that. He would quote the whole passage. And sometimes the one before and sometimes the one after. Because he knows the people. That was the hardest part for me in preaching, was at first not knowing the people. Not knowing how many people knew how to read, how many people had ever heard of the church before. And once you got accustomed to that, you realize they're really not that different than we are. Seated there the right is the preacher of that congregation. So that's what you would see. We wouldn't see three men sitting up here during the preaching. It wouldn't look like that. But are they doing what the scriptures say? Yes. Preaching the word of the Lord. That's what the church building might look like. Balloons, Christmas lights, and decorations. Their culture is different. They take pride in their building. We have carpets and we vacuum it and we have nice pews. They decorate. If you walked in, you'd think, well, they're having a VBS. That's just the decorations because they take pride in what little they could do. Sometimes it's paper mache stars they put up on the wall in one location I went to. But they're still worshiping the Lord. This is what it looked like from my point of view you see the women and children sitting on one side and the men, there's a man. And you see some women, but those may be families. But that's culture. That's not division in the church and misunderstanding. But imagine tonight all the women sat on this side, all the men sat on this side. Men, you don't sit with the, with the children. Your wife's going to sit with the children. That's what it looks like. But are they doing what the scriptures say? Yes. They're sitting on the ground. We don't sit on the ground. Notice the table there is a couple of water bottles. We wouldn't have water bottles sitting up here. It would look funny if we walked in and saw that. But are they worshiping the Lord? Yes. 
The invitation is offered here in the States everywhere I've been. There's a song of invitation. It's not against Scripture. That's not found there. But in India, they don't have a song of invitation. Once the preaching is done, then another man will give the invitation. And it may last several minutes. In this instance, the gospel was preached, and the Indian brother spoke in Telugu to the people, and a man's responding to the gospel. And he's walking to the front. Not everybody's standing and singing. He gets up and he walks to the front. In one location I was preaching, and after I was finished, they were off in the invitation. And there were some teenage girls sitting up in the front with their Bibles. And Brother John Ratton, my translator, was pointing to that girl and he was talking to her. And her Bible was open. She was smiling like a teenager. She was embarrassed. And all of a sudden, I saw a woman come from the back, walking up the aisle. And she looked at the girl and said something and pointed to her. Later, Brother John told me that was the girl's mother. And the mother came and told her, you know what you need to do. Why are you waiting? It would look strange here in the States if that happened. But that's the way it is in India. The fruits of worship, they do the same things we do. They're worshiping the Lord sincerely. This was that location on Sunday morning. That looks more like what we're used to. Very large building. And of course, there are the, the nets. The Lord's Supper, they had the individual packets. There's too many people, and, and because of, you know, that's what they've been doing for so long, they had the individual packets. We had our own packets. But there's the church building. There's people traveled from all over the Lord's Day. Worship began at 10. You know what time we left? Just worship, not Bible study. They'd already had Bible study for an hour. Worship began at 10. And we didn't finish until 11.45. An hour and 45 minutes. Not one time did I see children squirming, men nodding off to sleep. That's what they're used to. The culture there is different. The singing was amazing. They don't have notes. They don't have songbooks with notes like we do. They print their songbooks and it's just the words. And so can you imagine hearing singing when all they know is they've heard it from someone else and they don't have the notes, but it's singing and it's beautiful. And you don't know their language, but when the Lord's Supper song was sang and it was a song we knew in the book, there were tears in my eyes because they're worshiping God. They're singing the same song we do, just in a different language. They're serving the same God that we're serving. They're doing the same things the scriptures tell us to do. They're doing the same things. The fruits of worship are evident in India. The fruits of evangelism, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. The same truth, the same instruction for us and for them. 2 Timothy 2, 2. I like this one because I think there's a principle there that's really important. He tells Timothy, the things that you've witnessed among me, from me amongst many men. The things that Paul had taught, you'd heard it. I've taught it to a lot of people. He said, the same commit thou to faithful men that they may do so likewise. Now you say, well, that's a preacher speaking to another preacher. But Christian, do you remember what you did to become a Christian? Do you remember the gospel that was taught and you opened up your Bible and you looked at those scripture? I'm sure you know those. That's the principle. The same things that you and I did to become Christians are the same things we're to teach other people. And if we continue that process and we continue that cycle, then the church continues to grow. Picture here that day, that that was the location where 143 souls responded to the gospel. There are preachers standing in the back. You would say they've got note cards tucked into their pockets. Those are preachers. The problem was that people were pressing up to the front because we give Bibles and songbooks when people come forward to be baptized. And the problem was they wanted a Bible so bad that the widow ladies that were up at the front, and I'm leaning down and they're standing down, and I'm trying to hit them, they're pressing closer and closer and closer because they want a Bible so bad. And food's being prepared over to the left, back out of the way. They won't eat until they put on Christ in baptism. Because someone's taught them the gospel. Evangelism has taken place. It's not just, hey, you get a free meal if you come up and get underneath some water. These people have been studied with for a long time. And they're there because they want to hear the truth. And remember, it's harder sometimes for someone to not see it and understand it, but to commit to it. 
In one location we were there, they were immersing people outside in the baptistry, and, and a few women came up, and, and Brother John says, you see why they were reluctant? They stood around for a little while, and like they weren't sure what they wanted to do. He says, it's probably because when they get home and tell their husbands they're Christians, that they may be beaten, or they may be kicked out of their homes. That's the truth. That's the reality in India. And so it's very important they teach the gospel and they teach what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This man pictured up on the left said when he came up to the front, he said, I was baptized in a denominational church and I want to be baptized with true baptism and added by God to the true church. So is evangelism taking place? Here's the fruit. Someone told that man, your baptism in a denominational church was not adequate. You can't be taught wrong and baptized right. You can't be taught wrong and baptized in the wrong church and yet be okay with the Lord. Never been the case. So that man realized, I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins and God will add me to the church, not some men voting me in. Fruits of evangelism. Picture there in the middle, that's the picture of the school I mentioned to you, Herald School of Biblical Instruction. Those men are studying two weeks each month. They receive $10 a week to come to school. $10 a week, $20 total for the two weeks that are there for the month. They probably have a wife and children at home. So they're not working those weeks, they're studying. On the top right up there, you can see there are people standing on the hill. I couldn't really show the whole picture, but there, that's the location where 100, and, well, no, I'm sorry, that's the location. Yeah, that was 140, 143. They wanted to be baptized, and they said, Brother, normally we go back to the canal. It's not raining in a long time, so we're going to go over here to this mud pit. That's where the cattle and the pigs go to drink and waller in the mud. And you say, really? Why would they want to do that? Because when they're taught to be a disciple, nothing's going to stop them from being immersed. And Jesus says, go in all nations and make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. The problem at that location was the water wasn't deep enough. It was too muddy at the bottom and they wouldn't be able to immerse individuals. So they all went home and they said, well, when it's convenient, we'll do it. No. It was probably an hour later. They all found a way to go down the road several miles into a muddy ditch and they were baptized in muddy water there. Because evangelism means you're teaching someone you must be baptized for the remission of sins. And they have hearts like Naaman when they saw it's about being obedient it's not about what I want. It's about what's, what I'm instructed to do. And so we dip seven times in the Jordan River. They're immersed in water. And it doesn't matter if it's muddy, dirty. The cows have been in there. They don't care. They want to be immersed for the remission of their sins. Pictured on the bottom left, those are the tracks that I showed you earlier. They're printing those and sending those out for preachers to be able to use and Christians to use in villages. And then there's a better picture of the printing press on the right. Several machines. I saw books being bound together. They're cutting off um, parts after the printing. And they'll, that paper in the bottom right, they sell that paper. Someone's buying it somewhere. So they're being as effective as possible. They're printing their material and then sending out to the schools of preaching, to villages, to preachers' meetings, everywhere it can be used. Fruits of Benevolence. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, to let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, that you visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That word visit in the King James doesn't mean just step in and say, how are y'all doing? It means to see to their needs. In India, it means more than it does here in the States. If we were not supporting the widows and orphans there, they would be on the streets. And I don't say that in an exaggerated way. They literally would be on the streets begging, and many of them would have probably died years ago. There's no social system in India. There's no heart of most of the people to take because they're trying to feed themselves and their family. They can't take on someone else. And so years ago, Brother B. Ratnam, John's father, said, we've got to do something about these children. He brought five children home, and he told Sister B., his wife, he said, we're going to start an orphanage. And she said, what? He says, we have to do something, because if we don't, they'll starve to death. And so, you know, there are about 400 orphans. This was in Rampa. There's about 60 there, brothers and sisters, living there together, going to school, being taught the gospel. Every night, 
they have a devotion. They sit out on the floor and they sing songs in Telugu. And one night we were eating dinner, it was after dark, and we were eating, and I said, whoa, that's English. They're singing in English. And he said, brother, they're singing in English for you. And that got to my heart, because those children wanted to learn songs in English so that they could sing for us because we're English-speaking. Titus 3.8, we're instructed that as Christians, we know to do good and we have a responsibility to do good to others. Benevolent work is such an important part of the work in India. Picture there in the top left are some of the young girls from an orphanage, and they've got their fingers on their mouth. They came to the location, and we gave them blankets and towels. And this will be the only blanket and the towel they receive for the whole year. If you'd like to look at these afterwards, you're welcome to. They don't cover up with these. There's no reason to in India. It's too hot. They'll sleep on them. And here's the towel they will use. Of course, they wash their face, their hands, and their feet, and they'll receive these once a year. There at the bottom is a kitchen at an orphanage and widow's home. That's a top-notch kitchen. They have everything they need. They cook most of the time outside because of the heat, and then they're able to prepare food. You can see in the bottom right picture over there in one of the homes, there's stainless steel table, stainless steel tray, stainless steel cups. Perfect, because it'd be cleaned easily. And they have everything that they need. They eat three meals a day. Picture to the top right up there are the beds. If you could have a closer look, you would see that doesn't look like a comfortable bed. They have mattresses, but you know what they choose to do? They don't want to sleep on the mattress. It's not comfortable. They want to sleep on the metal bed, and they'll lay on top of the blanket. And you see these beds lined up, and they have little lockers, wooden boxes, and all the possessions they have are there. There's no toy room. There's no entertainment center. Look at the faces. The girl at the top, look at her eyes. That was one thing that was told to me repeatedly. When you go to India, look at their eyes. And you could see their eyes. And every one of them, thank you, sir. And their little British English accent. That's probably the only English they knew. The girl there at the bottom, she lived at the orphan's home in Rampa where we stayed most of the time. She was a little girl, shorter than all the other children there. But her personality stood out. And when they were playing games, she was right up in the middle of it. She wasn't going to let anybody push her over. And I asked her one day, how old are you? And she says, 10. I said, 10, you don't look a day over six. But she's a little bitty girl. And I think one day she'll be your sister. Because she's going to be taught the gospel. And she's going to have an opportunity to provide it for her. And you see those girls there in the previous picture with the boys. Those will be our brothers and sisters if they're not already Christians. If we weren't doing things to help them, they probably wouldn't be alive. And they certainly would not have the opportunities they have now to learn the truth. Here are the widows. Picture there at the top left, that widow is 90 years old. She is memorizing scripture. She never misses a prayer meeting. She likely can't read. She's memorized scripture because she's heard it over and over again in sermons or because someone has read the Bible to her. And at 90 years old, I wonder how long ago she would have passed if not for the help that's provided for widows. Because her husband died, her family deserted her. There at the bottom you can see many of the widows. Not all of them live in the widows' homes. Most of them have their own homes or they live with family members, but they are widows indeed. And so they need help. Picture there at the top right, you'll see sewing machines are given. Those are given to younger widows. Either their husbands have left them because they're Christians now, or they have died. And so sewing machines are provided for women who know how to use them so that they can provide for themselves and their family. Because in the past, what we found is women have turned to prostitution. They're taught the gospel. They realize they need to turn away from their sin. And then the opportunity is provided for them through a sewing machine. And then pictured at the bottom are the blankets and the towels that we give. And then the dresses for women. This is called a sari, and if I unraveled it, it would probably be from the end of that table all the way over here, and it's two pieces. They have undergarments, but this is to be worn on the top so that nothing shows through their garment because it's rather thin. And if you'd like to see this later, I'll unfold it for you, and they wrap it around in some magical way, and they put this on top to cover themselves up, and this is what they wear. And it's not uncommon to see belly showing. It's just the way it is. We wouldn't show our bellies here 
And certainly don't promote it in India, but that's the way it is many times. Their bellies are showing. But those are the dresses that are provided for those women. And so they likely only have the one we gave them and the one they were wearing. Standing in the middle, right below the man in the white shirt, was a widow who had flowers in her hair. And I knew she probably wouldn't be able to understand me, but I pointed her flowers and I said, they smell good. And she turned and did some sign language to me and told me that she couldn't speak. And so our sister Indira told me she's deaf. Her husband is no longer around. Her father was sick with COVID during the crisis. And so he's struggling to try to live. Her brother is traveling on his way to go visit her father who's sick. A tree falls on him and he dies. And then sometime later her husband dies. That sewing machine may be the only thing that is encouraging her to keep going and to remain faithful to the Lord. Because when you can't hear and you don't know sign language and you can't communicate, your husband's left you or he's dead, your father's dead, your brother's dead, then the sewing machine's provided so that that Christian lady can provide for herself and her children if she has children. And I'm thankful we're able to do things like that for those widows. The last point, the fruits of edification Romans 14, 19 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 tell us about edification. Edification is the building up of people. It's lifting them up. And so many times we don't understand the power of edification. In America, if someone were to walk in and stand up to preach and they had this draped over their shoulders and they wore some kind of necklace, we would think, what is wrong with them? This is the custom in India. This was given to us when we went to one of the preaching schools, very unique, and we joked about it and said this meant that we had an honorary doctorate. I got three of these, so I joked and said I'm doctor, 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 but that was their way of honoring us, and so many times flower wreaths were put around us, somebody hand wove those, got those flowers and hand wove those. And put around our necks for just a moment and then they're taken and used somewhere else. But this is what would happen. They would honor us and this was an honor. I was to take this home with me and if I didn't it would be disrespectful. And no, they don't go around wearing robes and jewelry. They don't adorn themselves as the Pharisees would do. But that's the type of edification, the honoring, the lifting up of the Americans when we come to visit. There pictured on the right are the children sitting at night that I mentioned and they're singing in English. And they're singing, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And tears are coming down in my eyes. They're lifting us up. They're edifying us through their song. And they wanted to sing in English for us. Picture to the top what it would look like when you went to a preacher's meeting. Those people are standing out in the heat. It's over 100 degrees. And they're cooking for six, seven, eight hundred people. They're wanting to edify, to lift up, to help others. We understand what that's like. You probably provide meals for people when they have had surgeries or death in the family. That's what it looks like in India on a larger scale. On the bottom, it's interesting. Those are not just chalk drawings. That ground there is not muddy ground. It is a paste. Someone's put together a plaster, a paste of cow dung and urine and clay. And they've put that together and put it on the outside of the children's home and the widow's home. They don't wear shoes. So they're walking around outside. And when that was told to me, I thought, that's strange. I mean, that's an interesting concept, but I thought, is there really anything to it? And I came on and researched it, and sure it is. It's an antifungal property. But somebody said, I'll do the dirty work. I'll put together this stuff and put it down so that they can walk and not have to worry about some type of fungal problems. And then the children are drawing on it. And they don't mean anything by it. They're just having fun and drawing. But sometimes edification comes through means that we don't understand. We do things and it lifts someone up. There's evidences of it everywhere. Someone put that plaster down, had to put their hands in that stuff and make it. Someone had to sit out in the heat and cook the food. And then we arrive in Tooney, and they've spent money and put a big sign up outside the church building honoring us. I don't deserve that. The first location I went to to preach was further earlier in the week and they had a sign, a banner hung up and we pulled around the corner and my name was on there. And I didn't like that because I don't deserve that. But that's who they are. They spent time and money they should have used somewhere else to feed people or maybe to buy clothes, but they wanted to do it to edify us, to lift us up. And so they built, 
They put the sign up there at the church building. It's a big sign. It's a big sign. They put our names on it, put flowers and decorate it. That's what edification looks like. Let us consider our fruits as we conclude. There's so much more to say about India, and if time was provided for us, we could just go on and on and on and on and on. If you have any questions, please catch me afterwards, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Let us consider our fruits. We saw the evidences of worship, benevolence, edification. What about our fruits? Look at Luke 6, verse 45. Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. If this is coupled with Matthew 7, it's about false teachers. And it's about someone who's truthful and honest. A good man brings forth good treasures, good fruit. I don't believe it's taken out of context to say, Christian, are we good Christians? Is there evidence of our Christianity that we're faithful to the Lord? Consider Matthew 3.8, Jesus is speaking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. John the baptizer had been teaching them out in the wilderness. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And we realize we're not the Christian that we should be. That we're not producing fruit like we should. And Jesus says a good tree produces good fruit. And maybe we're not producing any fruit at all. What must we do? We must repent and bear fruits worthy of repentance. We'll do whatever it takes to show that we truly are filled with godly sorrow. For godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Maybe there's something we can do for you tonight, Christian. You know you need to repent. We'll be willing to pray with you and pray for you. If you're not a Christian and you realize there are people in India who are learning the gospel, I've been studying the gospel and I, I, I want to become a Christian. I want to do what God wants me to do. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God Repent of your sins, confess His great name, be baptized for the remission of your sins, and walk faithfully, producing good fruit the remainder of your time here. Can we do something to help you this evening? We encourage you to come.